Greetings and welcome to the lecture on Standard Operating Procedures. Standard Operating Procedures represent an administrative control. This lecture module has been designed and developed to introduce you to the basic concepts of design and development of standard operating procedures. It is intended for beginners. In this lecture module, I will introduce you to the concept of the SOP. I will introduce you to the process of development of an SOP and provide guidance on the development of your own specific SOPs. Upon completion of this module, you should demonstrate the ability to describe the function of an SOP, describe the procedure of design, development, implementation and improvement of an SOP and design and develop a basic standard operating procedure. The goal of an SOP is to ensure reproducibility. What this means is that an SOP ensures that different individuals performing the same procedure obtain a similar result. This is very important in laboratory facilities which are involved in routine diagnostics and testing. We have a responsibility to the end users as well as to the patients whose samples we are analyzing and adherence to an SOP ensures that the results are reproducible. This is a graphical representation of what I have just mentioned. In any laboratory facility, we have different individual laboratory workers. Each of them has their own knowledge, skills and abilities. They conduct a same process using an SOP and ideally a good SOP should result in a same output or the same result. This is what might happen if your SOP has not been developed and designed in accordance with a standard procedure. You will have different laboratory workers conducting the same process, performing the same operations and you will have different results. In this case, your SOP must be revised. And this is part of the performance assessment, which I will discuss in the following week. Now an SOP is an instructional document. It is like a prescription, which is reader centered. And it is very important to engage the end users during the development of the SOP. As a biorisk manager, you must obtain input from the end users prior to formulating or developing the final version of the standard operating procedure. So the key point is instructional document, which implies that it states a clear set of instructions which can be achieved, which are measurable, and which can be evaluated after completion for performance and other issues. The instructional document teaches a reader to understand a rule or principle, envision a process or workflow, perform a task and use a tool. What this means is that the SOP should be very clear in terms of its context and in terms of the step-by-step -step implementation. The word envision refers to the ability of an individual to visualize the process. So the process must be comprehensible to the reader or to the laboratory worker as the case may be. They should be able to apply the step-by-step -step procedure to perform the task or to use a tool, as in the case of a laboratory, this may be a specific piece of equipment. Let us now move on to the process of development of an SOP. The process of development of an SOP depends on the process of analysis, 
So we first analyze a specific procedure. We design a set of steps around that particular procedure. We develop these steps and translate them into a document. We implement these steps at the laboratory level and we evaluate the procedure for effectiveness and consistency of operation. This is the basic procedure for SOP development. Now an instructional document or an SOP is based on certain other prerequisites. An SOP is generally based on a policy, which is a plan or guiding principle that influences other action. So this is the parent of the SOP, which is the policy. The policy then gets translated into a program plan, which is a set of tasks or actions performed in a specified sequence or manner that achieves a particular result. And finally, the program plan is translated into a procedure. A procedure is a specific task, work or instruction or action. And procedures may include actions as well as other specific requirements. A policy document is written with a certain audience in mind. We always ask who the audience is, who is the end user of the SOP or the policy document, who writes the document, the authors of the document. This may be the bio-risk manager as well as certain experts in that field and the intended purpose of the SOP. SOP has a very specific purpose and this must be clearly defined in the scope and objectives of the SOP. For instance, we will be looking at the process of disposal of biological waste in compliance with national regulations for the purpose of this particular lecture module. So I have answered those questions. So in the case of this particular document, who writes this document? It's the bio-risk manager in consultation with the laboratory workers and management. Who is the audience? laboratory workers and external contractors. Now I have used this specific term external contractor because in most containment laboratories, the process of disposal of biological waste or chemical waste is done via a third party or an external contractor. And this external contractor must be fully cognizant with regard to the SOP. And what is the intended purpose of the SOP is basically to ensure the safe disposal of biological waste in compliance with national regulations. This comes down to our original intent or our original title. Now, in order to develop your SOP, you must visualize the process. You should envision the entire process. Now, this is a process. It's Envision very simplistically. So we have biological waste which is being produced by a facility on a daily basis and this biological waste must be segregated at the facility itself in order to ensure that it is disposed of safely. So we can dispose of the waste after segregation as radioactive waste, biological waste or chemical waste as the case may be. Now in order for the transporter or the contractor to identify this particular waste, the laboratory workers must ensure that the waste is labeled appropriately. Following which, the waste is transported to another facility for disposal and incineration as the case may be. Now, most of the biological waste within a containment facility is autoclaved and incinerated. Autoclaving must be conducted or carried out at the facility itself and incineration may have to be carried out at another facility as this involves specific equipment such as incinerators. Radioactive waste and other waste such as chemical waste which may be components of the biological waste must also be treated in compliance with national regulations and guidelines. So this is basically our program plan for our SOP development. 
So the program plane designates specific steps. So we have the procedure for collection of waste, procedure for segregation of waste, transport of waste, decontamination and neutralization of waste, procedure for labels and signages, procedure for training of personnel handling biological waste, and the personal protective equipment which must be worn when managing biological waste. Now all of these represent separate SOPs in the program plan for the disposal of biological waste. The sections of the SOP are as follows. An SOP has conditions, context, specific actions and documentation. Let us look at these sections one by one. The conditions for the SOP should answer these following questions. Who should use the SOP? When should it be used? Why should it be used? and where should it be used. An SOP is a very specific document. It cannot be adapted for use to other situations or if it is adapted, it should undergo the process of implementation and validation. This is why these specific questions must be established when we set up the conditions for the development of the SOP. In this case, of disposal of laboratory waste. The users of the SOP are the laboratory workers. It is used during the disposal of laboratory waste. It is used for the safe disposal of biological waste and it should be used at the containment facility, transport and disposal facility as defined by the respective SOPs. The next aspect of SOP writing involves establishment of context. So the context involves a basic process in which we have an input. In this case, we have biological waste as an input. The actions which are used to treat that biological waste or mitigate the risk of exposure of laboratory personnel and the external environment to that biological waste. So we have specific actions which are listed in the SOP and the output which is the intended outcome of that particular SOP. When you establish context for an SOP, please ensure that you include preparation. Preparation assumes readiness before implementation of the SOP. For instance, what this implies is that specific procedures must be in place prior to the implementation of the SOP for the disposal of waste. This may include training of the laboratory personnel with regard to the segregation of the waste into biological, chemical and other components. Now we are developing this SOP based on the following context. We develop the SOP assuming that the personnel are trained, that they are competent, that facilities for storage are available, facilities for segregation exist, facilities for transportation exist, and facilities for decontamination exist. This is an assumption. Now, if any of these following measures do not exist, we must develop an SOP to fill in the gap. The actions are specific steps which must be taken to move from the input to the output. As I mentioned earlier, an SOP is reader centric, so the steps should be very clearly stated and should not be ambiguous. These are some of the steps or the actions which must be incorporated in the SOP for waste disposal and I have stated here checklist. Okay, now an SOP can be translated into a checklist with the step and a check mark. So the steps are as follows. Place all the waste from the facility into the designated container. So I check, label the containers with the designated labels, checked, and transfer the containers to the staging areas, checked, 
and inform the shipper when 50% of the staging area has been occupied, checked and so on and so forth. So these actions can be clearly defined and once the action has been completed, the buyer risk manager can check the SOP for implementation. In addition to the SOP itself and the checklist, documentation must be incorporated into the SOP and included in the appendices. This documentation includes cross-references such as guidelines and best practices, regulatory documentation pertaining to national laws on disposal of biological waste, as well as specific regional regulations. An SOP must be implemented and this provides a testing bed for the SOP. The SOP is tested at the level of the bench or the laboratory workbench. And these are some of the questions which a virus manager must pose to the end users of the SOP. The first one concerns comprehension. We must ask our end users if they understand the SOP. In some cases, the language used in the SOP may be too technical or too complicated for an end user to comprehend. And comprehension is critical in order to minimize errors. An SOP should not be ambiguous. The next aspect involves implementation. We must inquire with the end user if they could physically do what the SOP asks. If no, why? For instance, if you have provided a laboratory worker with a biosafety suit, which is not of the appropriate size, he or she may not be able to wear it, or if they do wear it, they may not be able to perform the operation because the suit is too tight. So in this case, an observation will provide the biorisk manager with the appropriate input. The next aspect is reproducibility. This comes back to different laboratory users achieving the same outcome. And if no, why? The next aspect is consistency. And this is critical when we do diagnostic testing in the laboratory as erroneous results can lead to different diagnosis and can affect the stakeholders and end users. So all of these aspects must be documented during the process of implementation of an SOP. Another aspect of SOP development involves validation and in validation we have what is known as behavioral observation data. A behavioral observation data is basically a questionnaire which we provide to the laboratory worker or the end user and all that he or she has to do is answer it as a yes or a no. There is no ambiguous answer for a BOD questionnaire. For example, does X don his biosafety suit in compliance with the SOP? Yes or no? For example, if the answer is no, then we investigate why. If the answer is yes, we continue with that particular SOP. So these are very useful in validating the SOPs from the perspective of the end user. So BODs help us to check and validate SOP. They are an objective assessment as a observer basically observes the laboratory worker and collects data. The observer himself improves as the observer notes the discrepancies between the SOP statements as well as the implementation plan. And finally, the VOD allows us to communicate across the group. For instance, if a specific laboratory worker cannot achieve a specific objective and obtain the reproducible result, it may be an indication of the failure of the system 
and this can be addressed by communicating across the organization. So BOD data must involve personnel who will be observed when developing the BOD questionnaire. For instance, if I am the bio risk manager and laboratory worker is involved in a specific procedure, I will involve him or her during the process of development of the questionnaire as they are more aware of certain factors which the bio risk manager may not be able to observe. The BOD also ensures consistency and it provides an opportunity for self audit, which is more realistic than an audit done by a third party. Now SOPs in general must be approved and this procedure of approval may involve several rounds of discussion and we may have consultative sessions with the bio risk managers, even the top management and the key stakeholders. So once an SOP has been designed and developed, it is tested in the lab, implemented and finally an approval is obtained which legalizes the SOP at the level of the organization. SOPs are living documents. They have to be revised and reviewed constantly and the review is dependent on various factors such as near miss accidents or incidents. If you experience accidents or incidents in your laboratory when implementing a specific SOP, the SOP will have to be reviewed. You may also have to review an SOP when the results are inconsistent. This SOP must be revised and reviewed periodically. So prior to review of an SOP, we must check the documentation and determine whether there has been any sign that it has been previously reviewed or revised. If there are too many revisions, it may be indicative of the failure in certain steps of the SOP and a review must be undertaken in consultation with the end users. Before you review or revise the document, you must obtain the pertinent documentation in the form of logs or laboratory files. There may be obstacles when you try to implement a revision. This may be because of a lack of equipment at the facility or a lack of ability to communicate the SOP across the laboratory users. And there are some solutions which may be implemented routinely for reviewing and revising SOPs. We now move want the general format of the SOP or the standard operating procedure. This is the general format of the SOP. I have not gone into specifics of SOPs as you will be developing a range of SOPs based on your specific organizational requirements. These are some of the components. So an SOP always commences with a title page. The title page may include the specific logos of your organization as well as a note indicating that it is a control document and the revision number. SOPs which are more than three pages long must be appended with a table of contents. Definitions of specific words or terms which may not be comprehensible to the end user must be included in the SOP. The purpose of an SOP must be stated from a regulatory context. For instance, a SOP for the donning and doffing of personal protective equipment must clearly state that this SOP has been designed and developed for laboratory workers who wish or intend to don and doff personal protective equipment. The procedures in an SOP must be 
clearly stated in a step by step format. The health and safety warnings must be included in SOP. For instance, usage of a specific chemical agent for sterilization may pose certain health and safety risks to laboratory workers. This must be stated in the SOP. We must also include what are known as cautions because sometimes SOPs are used concurrently with other SOPs and this can cause interferences. So this must be stated in the SOP. For instance, a laboratory SOP for spill cleanup may involve the use of chemicals and these chemicals may be hazardous to human health and may also compromise the engineering systems by corrosion. So in this case, we must state the interferences or the concurrent SOPs which must be read together with the SOP in general. Quality assurance and quality control are within the scope of the QC and QA policy of the organization and the SOP must take this into account as well as take into account other regulatory requirements during its implementation. The SOP must also include the references, the contact list indicating the authors and the bio-risk managers. The related SOPs must be included in the appendices. The distribution concerns the number of copies which are made because the SOP administrator decides who will obtain the copy and the location at which the SOP will be available. Archiving must be mentioned in the SOP as well as archiving ensures that the SOP is available for audit. As a general practice, all versions of the SOP including revisions and comments must be maintained in the archive in order to ensure that the process of auditing an SOP is carried out smoothly. The key messages which I wanted to get across to you in this module are as follows. SOPs are instructional documents which ensure reproducibility. They are designed to achieve a single outcome. Ideally, one specific outcome should have one specific SOP. For instance, the donning of a mask should be governed by one SOP, a single SOP itself. The donning of a complete set of personal protective equipment will be governed by another SOP. Now, effective SOP writing takes key components into account. When we develop an SOP, we must take into account the inputs from the respective stakeholders. And validation and evaluation of the SOP is critical to the process of continuous quality improvement. That brings us to the end of this module on standard operating procedures, which are a very important administrative control. Thank you very much for watching this video lecture and I wish you a pleasant learning experience. Thank you.